Good day, everyone. Thank you very much for watching my 30-minute presentation, which is part of the Parkinson's Insight Congress. My name is Dr. Matthew Phillips. I am a neurologist based out of Hamilton, New Zealand. I'm just going to minimize myself here so that you can see my title, which is Parkinson's Fasting and Ketogenic Diets. I hope you enjoy this talk. Let's begin. I'll start with a quote on imagination. It's been said that imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. I think this is a very apt quote for Parkinson's disease, a disorder in which we really need to start thinking outside of the box if we're going to find a way to halt or reverse it. And of course, the person that said this quote was the American astronomer and author Carl Sagan. What is Parkinson's? Parkinson's can be defined on several levels. We often describe what is seen on, the, on those levels. At the level of the person, what we see are motor symptoms such as tremor. On a smaller level, the level of the brain, we see substantia nigra neuron loss. And at an even smaller level, the level of the neurons, what we see are abnormal protein aggregates such as Lewy bodies. All of these things are undoubtedly correct, yet like an iceberg, there's a lot more to Parkinson's lying beneath that which we see. Let's look at the level of the person in more detail. What we see are typically those motor symptoms, tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, and later on, postural instability, as depicted by this picture on the right. This is the picture that people typically think of when they think of Parkinson's. Less apparent are the non-motor symptoms, the insomnia, fatigue, daytime sleepiness, cognitive impairment, pain syndromes, depression, anxiety, the latter two which affect quality of life more than any other symptom, urinary incontinence, sweats, postural drops in blood pressure, swallowing difficulties, bloating, and due to involvement of neurons in the gut, constipation. So there's a lot more to Parkinson's than the motor symptoms. The bulk of the disorder lies with the non-motor symptoms. Let's look at the level of the brain. What we see is neuron loss in this tiny uh, region in the brainstem called the substantia nigra, as depicted by that red dot on the diagram. By the time someone's diagnosed with Parkinson's, 50% or more of the neurons are already lost in that region. However, less apparent, if we look at the entire brain and the entire nervous system that innervates our organs, we see neuron loss throughout much of the rest of the brain. Basically, uh, the rest of the brainstem is involved, including the midbrain, pons, and medulla. And the neocortex, which is a very large part of the brain that wraps around the, the brain proper, like an envelope, that is also afflicted. If we go outside of the brain, there's neuron loss even in other parts of the nervous system, particularly the autonomic nervous system, with neurons that innervate the heart affected, possibly those that innervate the bladder, and the enteric nervous system, particularly the dopamine producing neurons in the gut, they are heavily afflicted, perhaps even more so, and at an earlier stage than the neurons in the, in the substantia nigra. So there's a lot more to Parkinson's than neuron loss in the substantia nigra. There's neuron loss throughout the entire brain and body. Let's look at the level of the neurons. What we see are abnormal protein aggregates, the famous Lewy bodies, as depicted by that gray circle there in the diagram. However, less apparent, and if we just focus on energy, we will see that there are other problems inside the neurons. This picture shows a neuron, that spindly yellow and gray structure on the right, and the black dots outside and inside the neuron represent glucose, its main fuel, and the orange triangles represent insulin, which is a hormone that allows glucose inside cells. This is a normal looking neuron. In Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other disorders, there's a reduced ability to utilize glucose as a fuel. The metabolism of it is somewhat defective, and the neurons may be insulin resistant as well. If we get even smaller, looking inside the neuron at the mitochondria, which are these little oval-shaped uh, batteries, if you were, that produce most of the energy for the neurons. There's one there shown by the yellow circle. They are uh, not normal in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other disorders. As you can see by the mitochondria circled there, they are too small and too round, and some of them are too long and skinny, and they're reduced in number. Finally, if we get even smaller and look at the walls of the mitochondria themselves, 
This is a depiction of the electron transport chain, which is a series of proteins lining the wall. Uh, the proteins are labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. And what you can see in the normal state is uh, a nice normal complex. However, in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other similar disorders, we have damage occurring at uh, most of the uh, complexes of the electron transport chain. And in Parkinson's, particularly the first complex at the far left there with the big red sign over it is affected most heavily. So again, with Parkinson's at the level of the neuron, yes, we have abnormal Lewy bodies showing up if we look at the neurons. However, uh, what is less seen is all these defects in neuron metabolism that occur as well. So let's summarize what we've just said uh, when it comes to Parkinson's, the seen and unseen. Parkinson's is, Parkinson's is an iceberg, the, the tip of which is represented by the motor symptoms, substantia nigra neuron loss, and abnormal protein aggregates. Currently, most of our medications and uh, treatments that are in the research pipeline are actually aimed at dealing with the tip of the iceberg. Our medications, such as levodopa, aim to mask the motor symptoms. Our uh, treatments, such as cell transplant therapies, like stem cells, are aimed at replacing neuron loss in the substantia nigra. And other treatments, such as the vaccines, are aimed at abolishing or removing the abnormal protein aggregates. Now, those are great and wonderful things. However, we're not treating the bottom of the iceberg, which is non motor symptoms, neuron loss throughout the brain and the rest of the nervous system, and perhaps most importantly, defective neuron glucose metabolism and defective mitochondria. So what I'm trying to get at here is that the heart of Parkinson's, the bottom of that iceberg, is characterized by impaired neuron metabolism. And if we don't treat that, then we're never really going to make any headway in halting or reversing this disorder. And to do that, we need a metabolic therapy. What is a metabolic therapy? Very good question. Essentially, therapies that optimize neuron metabolism and metabolism is the set of cell chemical reactions that sustain life. By one or more of enhancing neuron energy production and usage or enhancing neuron growth and repair and or protecting neurons from stress. That's what a metabolic therapy does. Now metabolism is extremely complex as shown by this diagram. This diagram is depicting uh, just some of the pathways of metabolism that occur within a neuron and as you can see there are probably um, hundreds, uh, dozens at least, perhaps uh, hundreds of these. And so what we need is a therapy that could, could repair these impaired uh, metabolic pathways on many different levels. I think it's asking a bit much for a medication that typically has one or several targets to do this. We need a therapy that can somehow target hundreds of pathways simultaneously. To find that, I think we need to look back in history for a little bit here and look at the history of human diet. The agrarian lifestyle, that which we currently live, is only about 12,000 years old. And this started with the advent of agriculture in the Fertile Crescent in, um, modern day, in the modern day Middle East, as shown by the green region in that picture. The agrarian lifestyle is characterized by a gradual increase in processed carbohydrate consumption, particularly sugars and grains, and frequent feeding periods throughout the day. We now eat three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and uh, many people actually have snacks between those main meals as well. So as a result of that lifestyle, agrarian neurons are like single fuel engines. They're running on carbohydrates, particularly glucose, one of the most simplest carbohydrates for their energy needs, virtually all the time, and therefore they are metabolically inflexible. They don't use any other fuels. But it wasn't always this way. If we look further back into the evolution of human diets, we can see that we were hunter-gatherers for far longer than we were agrarians. In fact, for over two million years, humans had a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. That consisted of real unprocessed food, which contained, in general, more fiber and fat. There were exceptions, but in general, more fiber and fat. And infrequent feasting, separated by long periods of fasting, where we would have, we would have to do without um, significant nutrient intake for days or even weeks, simply for the reason that there wasn't anything around. So hunter-gatherer neurons were actually uh, somewhat forced to be more like hybrid fuel engines. When people were fasting, they relied largely on fat-derived ketones for energy rather than glucose. Ketones are organic molecules that the liver produces from fat, 
and when one is one was fasting they would have been produced from body fat and the ketones uh, are a wonderful second fuel source for muscle and particularly brain they have a lot of uh, advantages over glucose as a fuel but the bottom line is here that these early humans for two million years retained metabolic flexibility they could use glucose for fuel and they used ketones for fuel and they used uh, very often both of them for fuel at the same time so let's look at fasting more closely fasting is uh, a metabolic therapy arguably the original and best metabolic therapy if we define it it is a voluntary abstinence from food and drink for controlled periods of time that's not starvation starvation is involuntary and it's uncontrolled fasting can be done several different ways however one of the most common ways is to do a fluid only fast such as water black coffee and tea maybe some salt supplementation and the beauty of fasting is it has been shown to be able to alleviate the defective glucose metabolism uh, that characterizes conditions like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's so it can alleviate the insulin resistance and the ketones can actually uh, enter the neuron a different way from the from the glucose and make up for the shortfall in glucose metabolism fasting has also been shown to upregulate mitochondria biogenesis so these uh, low numbers of small overly circular mitochondria uh, can be increased in number and the mitochondria shape can actually be restored and fasting there's also pre preliminary evidence that fasting can enhance mitochondria function by uh, sort of repairing those damaged elements of the electron transport chain which will improve energy production and function of the mitochondria now that's just referring to energy uh, fasting has many effects beyond energy production alone this diagram shows how it affects many master regulators of metabolism uh, and cell growth otherwise but uh, I don't have really much time to go into these other pathways. The bottom line here is that fasting optimizes neuron bioenergetics, neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, and neuron resilience. And so you can see how these things would be, uh, quite frankly, wonderful for a disorder like Parkinson's. So again, fasting recreates an ancient evolutionary metabolic state, and that state is aimed at optimizing neuron metabolism. That's the exciting thing about fasting. Now there's another metabolic therapy out there, ketogenic diets or keto diets. They're not quite as powerful as fasting, but uh, they're pretty good, I think. Keto diets are high fat, very low carb diets that like fasting also increase neuron reliance on ketones for energy. The picture there shows a few foods that would be part of a, uh, a keto diet. That There's a lot more foods, not just those ones. Now with fasting, ketones are derived from body fat Keto diets, they're derived from dietary fat. That's probably the essential difference between the two. With a keto diet, it's, it's more a process of removal, and a lot of the agrarian foods are removed, such as sugars, grains, and large fleshy fruits, uh, which were actually fruits have been selected by farmers to be larger and fleshier than they were in their wild state. And with fasting, we also step up sources of fat, such as the oils, olive oil, nuts and seeds, and high fat source foods such as avocados uh, notably those last two foods there are pretty high in fiber as well so the main goal of a keto diet and this is often confused the main goal of a keto diet is simply to mimic the fasted metabolic state so that we can optimize neurometabolism like fasting does there's nothing really else terribly special about a keto diet other than that so in my estimation keto diets are about uh, neuron health primarily so let's look at how we could treat parkinson's in its entirety looking at the tip of the iceberg we have the motor symptoms substantia nigra neuron loss and abnormal protein aggregates we can still use our medications they're still going to be useful and perhaps even some of those other uh, research uh, treatments in the research pipeline may be useful as well however if we're going to really treat the bottom of the iceberg, the heart of Parkinson's, we need to optimize neuron metabolism. We need to attack it from its bottom. And I think fasting and keto diets are two metabolic therapies that can do that. There are others that I don't have time to talk about. And maybe if we treat the bottom of the iceberg, we'll get a tri trickle up effect and we'll find that the tip of the iceberg improves as well.
Okay, so that's the theory. How about the practice? How about the reality? Well, this is what we looked at a couple years ago with the Parkinson's Dietary Study. In 2017, we conducted a world-first randomized study investigating the impact of a keto diet in Parkinson's. The formal title of our study was Low-Fat versus Ketogenic Diet in Parkinson's Disease, a Pilot Randomized Controlled Trial. I should mention, although I was the first author of the study, uh, there were many other people involved. We had a very small but dedicated team of co-investigators involved, without whom this could not have been possible. And of course, it goes without saying that we had a number of very dedicated patients uh, enter this study, and without them, there's no way it could have happened. Moreover, we were not the first investigators to apply a keto diet to Parkinson's ever. There was one earlier non-randomized study that did this. So this study formed the background and part of the inspiration, actually, for uh, our study. In 2005, uh, Dr. Ted Van Italy, who's unfortunately no longer with us, and his team conducted a four-week study of a keto diet in seven Parkinson's patients and showed symptom improvement along the lines of 43%, primarily the motor symptoms, in five people who completed the study. The formal title was Treatment of Parkinson's Disease with Diet-Induced Hyperketonemia, a Feasibility Study. Now, Dr. Van Italy himself acknowledged in the paper two problems with the study, other than the fact that it uh, was rather short at four weeks and only involved seven people. First, they used a very low protein content in their keto diet. Now that's a problem uh, since uh, levodopa and protein sort of compete with each other for absorption into the body. And so if you knock the protein down low enough, you basically are going to enhance the levodopa, the medication effect. And so part of that 43% improvement may have been simply for the reason that the medications were working better. Another problem with the study was that there was no control group. There was no group on a usual diet or a sort of a standard recommended diet to compare the keto diet with. And uh, without that, it becomes impossible to tease out the effects of a placebo effect. A placebo effect, which can be powerful in Parkinson's, is where someone expects to get better, so they do. It's a real neurological effect. And so part of that 43% improvement could have been due to a placebo effect as well. So we uh, wanted to... Um, try and improve upon this, uh, this wonderful initial pilot study by examining the feasibility, effectiveness, and safety of a keto diet in a longer study, a larger study, and we wanted to use normal protein levels and, of course, have a control group. Okay, in terms of study design and participants, what we did was we conducted a single phase, so everybody ran through it at the same time, eight-week randomized controlled study, so we doubled the length of time, and we compared these two diets. Our control diet was a low-fat diet which was uh, made as per national guidelines and of course the intervention diet was a keto diet. We randomized half the participants to the low-fat diet and half to the keto diet, measured their Parkinson's motor and non-motor symptoms at baseline and then four weeks later measured them again and then four weeks after that at week eight we measured them again and we basically compared how they were doing at baseline compared with how they did at week eight. We employed broad eligibility criteria. We wanted to make the study applicable to as many people as possible, so we allowed a broad range of age groups, up to 75 years of age, and we entered people with mild or moderate or severe Parkinson's. Uh, we basically accepted almost everybody except people who were bed-bound. In terms of the diets, the low-fat diet, we tried to make it as healthy as possible. There was very little sugar. It was a, a lot of vegetables and meats, whole grains and fruits. 20 to 25 percent of the calorie intake was from fats and the protein intake was controlled at just over one gram per kilogram. The keto diet, of course, we also tried to make healthy. It had a lot of vegetables as well. It had meats too, uh, but those meats were often accompanied by fatty uh, accompaniments such as uh, cheese in this chicken parmesan recipe. We had um, egg dishes, for example, with uh, high-fat accompaniments such as this goat cheese omelet. And of course, we had desserts in the keto diet, uh, such as this coconut oil dark chocolate cup with almonds and blueberries on top. 
The keto diet had 75 to 80% of its calorie intake from fats, so vastly different from the low-fat diet. Um, however, the protein intake was the same as the low-fat diet, low diet. It was controlled at just over one gram per kilogram. So it was really important that we have a sort of a normal protein level so that we minimize that levodopa absorption effect. And also we wanted to have, even more importantly, the protein the same between each diet so that even if we did have that levodopa effect, it would at least be affecting both of the diet groups the same. In terms of assessments and diet support, this was kind of innovative. We had participants self-assess their blood glucose and ketone levels every day for eight weeks. And they did that with these blood glucose ketone monitors, finger prick blood test every day, write down the numbers in their diet plan, and that's it. And everyone did this quite successfully. We had diet-blinded neurologists assess the Parkinson's motor and non-motor symptoms at baseline week four and week eight. So they were blinded to diet. Uh, they weren't blinded in, in reality, of course. We used the MDS-UPDRS, which is the most comprehensive uh, measurement tool for measuring the Parkinson's and motor and non-motor symptoms in their entirety. And we uh, were very strict about using the same neurologist for each patient, and we measured each patient uh, this, on the same weekday and time of day at baseline week 4 and week 8. So for example, if someone was always measured on Tuesday at 2.15 p.m., then that day and that time was kept consistent throughout the study. And that's really important for the reason that Parkinson's can fluctuate throughout the day, even hour to hour. So we had to do that to um, keep things as controlled as possible. We also had supportive videos, emails, and phone calls. Okay, so that's enough of the methods. How about the results? What did we show? So first of all, was a keto diet feasible? Well, we had 44 people commence the diets and overall an 86% com uh, percent completion rate. So that's pretty good for a keto diet uh, study, even one uh, that's only eight weeks long. If we look at the mean blood ketone levels over eight weeks, as shown by this figure here to the right, the blue line shows the ketone levels for the low-fat diet, and they averaged about 0.2 millimole per liter, which basically means that ketones had a neg negligible contribution to whole brain metabolism in the low-fat diet group. The red line depicts the ketone levels for the keto diet, they had a much higher level of 1.2 millimole per liter. So if we translate that to what it means in terms of energy, the ketones were actually contributing about 15 to 20% of whole brain metabolism. Now, it doesn't look like that line's a lot higher than the low-fat diet line. However, that uh, is a substantial difference in ketone production, a very big difference. For uh, comparison with other things that raise ketones, a very strong keto diet will... Uh, elevate the ketones consistently to about the 3 to 5 millimole per liter mark. And one really has to fast for several days or longer to keep the ketones elevated at 6 to 8 millimoles per liter. It's You can't go above 8 millimoles per liter in terms of ketones unless you have type 1 diabetes and you stop taking your insulin. So overall, I'd say the keto diet was definitely feasible for 8 weeks. How about effectiveness? Was a keto diet effective? Well, let's look at the effect on motor symptoms. In fact, both diets showed improvement in the motor symptoms by about 20%. Now, this could have been due to a diet effect. Both these diets were, I think, healthier than what most people were taking before. For example, there was no beer or ice cream or our high sugar in, uh, in uh, chocolates or sweets in, in either diet. However, a placebo effect could have also affected both uh, diet groups as well. So they both could have had that expectation of benefit uh, resulting in uh, actual benefit. So we underplayed these improvements in motor symptoms. The important finding from the study was the effect on non-motor symptoms. So if we look at this figure to the right, the blue line shows the low-fat diets uh, improvements, and the red line shows the keto diets improvements. Lower is better. And basically, the keto diet produced significantly greater benefits in these non-motor symptoms, 41% versus 11%. So the keto diet uh, dropped <laughs> the, the non-motor symptom uh, severity, improved them by almost half, whereas the low-fat diet sort of improved them by around 10%, and it wasn't really getting any better. Whereas you can see from the trajectory of that line, uh, the keto diet was continuing to improve, and I really wonder what would have happened if we'd gone to week 12. 
Most improved were urinary problems, pain, fatigue, daytime sleepiness, and cognitive impairment. That's really important and exciting, for these represent some of the most disabling, least levodopa responsive symptoms. And that implies that perhaps we could uh, use a keto diet alongside medications to really get a combined uh, approach going for Parkinson's that would be better than either alone. So overall, I think uh, a keto diet was very effective at improving these non-motor symptoms. Lastly, was a keto diet safe? Well, if we look at the top adverse effects of a low-fat diet, excessive hum hunger was the number one. That wasn't a big surprise. That's a well-known side effect of low-fat diets. If we look at the top adverse effects of the keto diet, this was a bit more of a surprise. Exacerbated tremor and or stiffness, that sort of occurred intermittently, especially in the first couple of weeks of the study and affected half of all the participants by week four. By week eight, it was down to about 30% of them and it was much uh, less so in those 30%. So I think it was some kind of uh, fat adaptation thing. Remember, we were introducing a very high fat content to these people all of a sudden. And in fact, that uh, hypothesis is corroborated by the, looking at the rest of the adverse effects. You can see in, in the low-fat group, the side effects weren't really getting any better by week 8, whereas in the keto group, uh, these three, and in fact all of the others, were definitely getting better by week 8. So I think there, uh, there was a fat adaptation thing going on here, and the bottom line is that most of these uh, side effects were pretty minor, and a keto diet, at least for 8 weeks, is safe. So the study conclusions were as follows. Modified diets are feasible and safe in Parkinson's for up to eight weeks. Both diets improved the motor symptoms by about 20%, but we played that down because it could have been due to a diet effect or a placebo effect. And lastly, this was the exciting finding. The keto diet markedly improved the non-motor symptoms 41% versus 11%. That's a big difference, particularly the most disabling, least levodopa responsive symptoms. And that study was published in 2018 in the Journal of Movement Disorders if you want to have a closer look. And the diet plans are there too. So where does this leave us with regards to the future of metabolic therapies? Since they optimize neuron metabolism rather than target a specific disease, metabolic therapies may actually benefit other difficult neurological disorders. We're currently running a 12-week randomized crossover study in Alzheimer's disease. And we're planning to run a 12-week pilot case series in Huntington's disease. These are both neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinson's. With regards to Parkinson's, what is needed is a larger and longer study. We don't have anything in the works at the moment. We're thinking about it. Um, perhaps other people are too. So I would say the future of metabolic therapies is quite bright. But I, I, I guess I should remind you guys and keep reminding myself that these are very early days and we do need much more evidence before we can start recommending uh, these metabolic therapies more firmly. So the bottom line of my presentation is as follows. There are actually three bottom lines. First, most of the iceberg that is Parkinson's lies not in what is seen, but in what is, uh, what is not seen. And at the bottom of that iceberg lies impaired neuron metabolism. That, in my estimation, is the heart of Parkinson's. The metabolic therapies, such as fasting, such as keto diets, aim to treat Parkinson's in its entirety by optimizing neuron metabolism. So these metabolic therapies aim to strike at the heart of the disorder. And lastly, in people with Parkinson's, we showed that a keto diet markedly improved the non-motor symptoms. And I should state that this occurred in just eight weeks, which was quite remarkable. So I'll finish this presentation off with another quote, a quote on incredible. It's been said that somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. I think that this quote is also apt for Parkinson's disease. I think that with time we're going to find that we will be able to halt or reverse this disorder and when it comes to that time metabolic therapies are going to be the backbone of that approach. I may be wrong, that's what I think. And of course the person that said this quote was Carl Sagan. My name is Matthew Phillips. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch uh, this presentation. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and have a truly wonderful day. Thank you.